Uh, a quick uh, housekeeping note about our 36th annual golf tournament, uh, the KCC Golf Tournament or Day of Golf. Uh, we have uh, had it under a recommendation from the Harvest Golf Club uh, that we uh, we had a data set of May 26, the day after the circuit breaker was to lift. Uh, there, there really was not enough turnaround time uh, in, in case something else happened. So we decided to push that out uh, out to July 21st. So still uh, registrations available online at uh, KelowneChamber.org and uh, some sponsorship uh, available as well for our members. Excellent. And just uh, a reminder that uh, our uh, COVID-19 resources can be found at OkanaganWeGotThis.com. Um, uh, it's got the latest news, updates, resources, and success stories from our members. You know, on this site, we keep you and the business community updated on issues and initiatives that are aimed at fostering uh, really a positive business environment that will ultimately lead to a stronger and healthier Okanagan community. I think that's what we all want. A uh, little more information about our Q&A today, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. So if you have a question, we have a button for that. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of your uh, screen, of the Zoom uh, screen, there is a Q&A function that can be used, uh, clicked on anytime to post a question, anytime throughout this, uh, this webinar. Uh, there are going to be some questions that have been prepared in advance that will be asked uh, to uh, the, uh, the Honorable um, uh, Selena Robinson, um, but uh, as well, q Q a is going to unfold as time allows, so hopefully we can get to as many questions as possible. Uh, now I'd really like to start those introductions and would like to uh, introduce um, Dr. Andrew Hay, uh, Provost and VP Academic from Okanagan College, uh, representing the Okanagan School of Business. Over to you, uh, Dr. Hay. Well, thanks very much, Shane. Um, the college certainly values our relationship with the chamber and the opportunity to sponsor events like the speaker series. And just so a little bit of news to the college, uh, at the end of March, our business students competed in the virtual Enactus Regionals and Enactus OC won three top awards, uh, including a new category this year, uh, which was a national uh, competition that took place at the regionals and we took top prize uh, in that category. So in uh, May, coming up pretty soon, obviously, uh, uh, we have some teams now headed off to nationals to compete and we'll wish them well. Uh, our students are just finishing up their final exams this week. Uh, and by all accounts, the students have done, you know, tremendously well through a very difficult year, uh, getting through most of their training on in online format. So pretty impressive what the professors and students have been able to accomplish where the school is developing uh, some new programs, including an HR certificate uh, designed for those looking at, uh, for a CPHR designation. So that's going through the approval process right now. And for September, uh, we're expecting to be back on campus, uh, but at the same time, we'll be offering courses in different modalities, including online offerings so that all of our students will be able to continue their programs, education unimpeded no matter what the pandemic should throw at us. So we're working hard at getting ready for what that student experience will look like. So with that, I'll turn it back to Shane. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hay. And uh, my apologies, uh, I did want to mention that um, uh, the Okanagan School of Business and Okanagan College are generous sponsors of the OC Speaker Series. Um, so thank you for that, uh, that welcome. Uh, now wanted to um, introduce Jeff Robinson, uh, our chair of the Kelowna Board, um, Kelowna Chamber Board of Directors. Uh, Jeff is going to be our host for the remainder of the session, and he's going to introduce Finance Minister Honor, on the Honorable Selena Robinson and moderate the Q and A to follow the minister's presentation. Jeff, thanks for uh, being here, and uh, over to you. Thanks for that, Shane. Uh, I want to bring greetings uh, to all of you in attendance from the Kelowna Chamber Board of Commerce. We had a board meeting this morning, and I expect many of our board members are here today in attendance. It's always exciting to hear from a, a Minister of Finance. Uh, the Chamber, as you know, uh, works hard to advocate for its members, and budgets are where you really see traction uh, for some of our main policy ideas. And we're pleased that this budget has given uh, money to the, the areas where the Kelowna Chamber has advocated for our members. Uh, I want to thank again the Okanagan School of Business for its partnership in the speaker series. Uh, we've got a, a multi-year partnership running with them and it's great that we can produce these kinds of, of content uh, for our members and it's only with assistance from the Okanagan School of Business that we can do that. So thank you uh, to them. 
Uh, before I get to introducing the minister, I want to point out that our, our own MLA, Ben Stewart, is in the audience today. Uh, I, I know that uh, our local MLAs have enjoyed a cooperative uh, relationship with their counterparts in government. And I'm sure uh, Minister Stewart will be taking notes today uh, from what he hears from Minister, Ro uh, pardon me, Emily Stewart will be taking notes uh, of what he hears from Minister Robinson. So last week, the Honourable Selena Robinson tabled her first budget as BC's Finance Minister. Uh, she's now generously uh, taking her time to join us to explain some of the key details from her point of view and to hear from us, uh, our Okanagan businesses. This is going to be a great opportunity to hear direct from Finance Minister about the government's priorities, both for the short term and the longer term, and also about what support will be there for local organizations that are facing real challenges as a result of COVID-19. There are many chamber wins in this budget, uh, including investments in green hydrogen economy, wholesale pricing uh, for liquor for hospitality licensees, PST exemptions for some manufacturers, tourism funding, training spaces for ECE, money for temporary farm workers, and other agricultural funding. And today's town hall hopefully will let us hear more about uh, those important areas. Uh, Minister Robinson, as you heard from Shane, will provide an overview of, of the budget and then a Q&A session will follow. Again, if you have questions, start putting them in now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'd all like to uh, ask as many questions as we can. And so finally, we'll get to the, the biography of, of, of Minister Robinson. She was first elected as the MLA for Coquitlam Mallard Bill in 2013. She has previously served as the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. And in that capacity, she led housing investments throughout uh, the, or pardon me, through the 10-year Homes for BC plan to build housing of all types and communities right across the province. She's also managed major capital investments in public transit through her work with the Mayor's Council and TransLink, and has worked hard to support local governments through the pandemic. And so with that, I'm very pleased to welcome the Honourable Selena Robinson uh, to present to us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, and I would uh, like to begin my, my remarks by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the territory of the Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak uh, with certainly the Kelowna Chamber, but I understand that other chambers of commerce uh, have been invited to join us. So uh, thank you for having me so that uh, we can have this um, opportunity to be all together virtually. I'd also like to introduce that there's a, a number of a government caucus MLAs who are joining us as well. We have from uh, Vernon Monashi, we have Harwinder Sandhu, and from Boundary Similkameen, we have Rolly Russell. And I'm really thrilled that Ben Stewart is able to join us as well. Um, we have all certainly been feeling the pandemic. Uh, it's, we're 14 months in, and it's touched uh, our lives in ways that we never could have imagined. Uh, and uh, many people continue to feel the effects, uh, and, and we will feel them for some time. Uh, but there are, I believe, uh, reasons for hope, uh, including, you know, with the vaccination rollout um, happening daily uh, and more and more uh, people getting vaccinated, that certainly tells us that the end is near. Uh, and we're seeing some positive signs in our provincial economy. Budget 2021 is about building today for a better tomorrow. It responds to the impacts of the pandemic, today's challenges, and it pre prepares us for the challenges ahead. We are investing in, in healthcare. We are strengthening the services that we all depend on, and we are building a bridge to recovery to the better days ahead. The pandemic will end, and when it does, BC will be ready for the opportunities that come with recovery. And that, I have to say, is a powerful testament to the incredible resilience that we have seen from the people here in our province. We've seen it in the businesses and we've seen it in communities. Everyone has shown tremendous resilience as we've navigated these unfamiliar and strange waters together. And I know that we can continue to count on that in the days, weeks, and months ahead. So before I move on to budget details, uh, I do want to do a, a brief review of the broader economic picture. This slide shows private sector growth forecasts for Canada and the provinces. All provinces saw significant impacts last year, as shown on the chart on the left. A recovery is expected for this year, and in the recent weeks, the private sector forecasters have updated their near-term economic growth projections for BC to show a stronger recovery than was anticipated just a few months ago. The projection shows BC's recovery is expected to be better than the national average, and once again, it speaks to the resiliency of BC's economy and that despite the challenges of the, this last year, our strengths remain. BC enjoys abundant natural resources, is a gateway to Asia, and we have highly skilled, talented people. 
Budget 2021 is focused on the province's response and recovery from the effects of COVID-19. Budget deliberations took a thoughtful approach to make sure that government, first and foremost, continues to protect the health and safety of British Columbians. We're also here to support people and businesses as we continue to, to navigate and manage through the effects of the pandemic and to do the important preparation work so that we can be ready to seize the opportunities, the opportunities that recovery will hold. In addition to new permanent investments of $8.7 billion over the fiscal plan, we've also included significant pandemic and recovery contingencies, which is essential. It's essential to keep us nimble and responsive to your needs and to the needs of all British Columbians. This will also ensure that the province can continue to deliver COVID-19 response and recovery measures and help us manage the ongoing uncertainties and the risks with the pandemic. Budget 2021 also makes significant new capital investments and commitments in the health, transportation and education sectors. These are things like hospitals and schools and roads, post-secondary facilities, transit, um, and other infrastructure around the province. We are expected, uh, our investments expect, are expected to be a record $26.4 billion over the fiscal plan period. Now, I know that often finance ministers take a very narrow view um, when we present to chambers of commerce and boards of trade, um, but I think it's really important uh, that, that we're all clear that we're, we're people first and foremost, and making sure that our friends and families um, are safe and healthy is absolutely critical for us to do the important work that, that we need to do with our businesses and service delivery. Um, so um, we need to make sure that, that the negative economic impacts that we experience um, are, are real um, if there's a lack of services uh, and supports for the people who need it. If we don't have healthy people, we can't have a healthy economy. And this last year has highlighted the importance of a strong health uh, uh, response and having the mental health services that, that we need. As more and more people get vaccinated, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not there yet and we need to keep pe people safe as our top priority. Budget 2021 provides more than $4 billion in funding for health and mental health to continue to provide to protect people from COVID-19 and expand the services that people rely on. This includes the continued support for the largest ever vaccination program in BC's history to ensure that every British Columbian can receive a vaccine. Budget 2021 also includes funding to reduce wait time for surgeries and give patients faster access to the help that they need. Support for seniors who have had an especially frightening and lonely year. We're supporting them with improvements in long-term care and home care. Budget 2021 includes the largest investment in mental health services in BC's history, and it uh, will help us build a network of mental health supports for youth through schools and new foundry centers and integrated child and youth supports in 15 more school districts. Our investment will improve access to and quality of mental health services throughout British Columbia including uh, improving mental health and addiction services for Indigenous peoples, increasing access to a full spectrum of substance use treatment and recovery services, including funding for opioid treatment, and helping more people get on the path to recovery with new substance use treatment and recovery beds. Budget 2021 will also focus on building critical health infrastructure with $7.8 billion in capital investments to support major construction projects like new and upgraded hospitals. And I'll have more to say on that shortly. We all know that every day, people and businesses across our province are working hard to fight the virus and to get life back on track. And we are working together with you to do just that. We're continuing to invest in services that people count on. The budget increases funding in the K-12 education sector to support our children and teachers, our schools and our families. And it includes free public transportation for children 12 and under in time for classes in September. What this means for, for families in the Okanagan that rely on, on transit, they could save up to $400 per child per year. And we also know that not everyone was affected by the pandemic in the same way. For people who are already experiencing economic and social barriers, 
the pandemic presented yet another barrier to getting the help that they need. This is why Budget 2021 funds the largest permanent increase to income and disability assistance rates ever. For low-income seniors, we doubled the senior supplements rate, the first increase in the history of the program, which started in 1987. Our government is also continuing to support people experiencing homelessness by providing more than 3,000 temporary shelters and hotel spaces for people who don't have a roof over their head. This includes meals, support staff, and equipment needed to keep these shelters safe. These investments will, will, uh, will help us continue to make progress towards meeting our poverty reduction goals of reducing the overall poverty rate by 25% and the child poverty rate by 50% by 2024. We also know that quality, affordable, and inclusive childcare is critical to families, communities, and to the economy. In 2018, we launched our Childcare BC to bring affordable, accessible, and quality childcare to families right across the province. Since then, we have funded the creation of over 26,000 new childcare spaces, with thousands more new spaces funded each year under the New Spaces Fund. Now, Budget 2021 provides funding to create even more spaces. And it helps support the workforce behind the workforce with rate wage increases for early childhood educators. We are more than doubling the number of children who can get care for $10 a day or less through the Universal Child Care Prototype Program. And in this budget, we have 400 new spaces for the Aboriginal Head Start Program, which provides culturally relevant child care for Indigenous families. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to the high activity that we are seeing in the housing market. With more people working from home, the demands for more space has increased activity. Low interest rates combined with low inventory of homes has driven up prices. However, we do expect moderation in the market in 2022 as the recovery takes hold and all orders of government continue our combined efforts to improve housing affordability. We have worked hard to tackle the housing crisis by addressing speculation, reducing rent increases, and we currently have a rent freeze in effect and we were making progress but the pandemic has changed things significantly. We are continuing to work towards meeting our goal of building over 114,000 affordable homes over 10 years. To date, more than 26,000 new homes have been completed or are underway, and Budget 2021 continues in that direction. We are continuing to fund new low and middle income housing units with funding to nonprofit housing providers and $1.6 billion in, in provincial capital investment in housing. We are also providing $2 billion in additional financing to expand the Housing Hub program. This will help to create an additional 9,000 new homes for families, for middle-income families, over the course of the next three to five years, on top of the 1,000 homes that have been completed by the Housing Hub to date. Now, a central commitment of government is to make life more affordable for British Columbians. Budget 2021, focuses on investments that will ensure that no one is left behind and we, as we continue to fight the pandemic and move into recovery. These investments build on previous measures taken to make a difference for people every day, including more affordable childcare that we are continuing to expand in this budget. We've already eliminated MSP premiums. In last year's budget, Budget 2020, the, we offered uh, and brought forward the BC Child Opportunity Benefit that families started receiving just this past October. But now families will deliver, uh, it will deliver for families a full savings for the, this first year in 2021. We've eliminated bridge tolls and we've eliminated student loan interest. And we are also delivering on more affordable car insurance that starts just this weekend. These measures and those in Budget 2021 all contribute to make life more affordable here in our province. Budget 2021 continues to provide measures to uh, help businesses adapt and to prepare and seize the opportunities that come with recovery. We didn't wait to get uh, support into the hands of businesses that needed help. And Budget 2021 builds on those supports uh, so that we can, that we've provided over the past year so that we can continue going forward. 
This includes the stronger BC Tax Incentive for employers that have hired or increased compensation in the last quarter of 2020 compared to the previous quarter. We have more funding for the Grow BC, Feed BC and Buy BC strategies. We have a PST exemption for select machinery, machinery and equipment to help businesses expand their operations. And we have ongoing funding for the small and medium sized business recovery grant program. Budget 2021 includes supports targeted at the hardest hit sectors like tourism, arts, and hospitality. These supports include $120 million through budget 2021 to support tourism recovery starting this year. Um, it includes supports for major uh, uh, anchor attractions that help make British Columbia such a wonderful, unique destination. We have additional funding for community destination development grants that will help communities prepare for future visitors through new tourism infrastructure like trails and airport improvements. We're also supporting 14,000 restaurants, bars, breweries, wineries, gyms and fitness centers through the most recent health restrictions through the Circuit Breaker Business Recovery Grant. And now we've, we've added uh, hotel industry to that list. We have worked to be nimble through the pandemic and creating new supports quickly as they were needed. We are adjusting our response as the landscape changes. This is exactly why we have built, we've built into the budget significant pandemic and recovery contingencies. The Circuit Breaker um, Business Relief Grant is a great example of this. The program was developed in less than a week, and then two weeks later, we had to adjust it again. And we will continue to get help out quickly to those who need it, when they need it. And we will continue to support businesses through this challenging time to help everyone prepare for recovery and the weeks, months, and years ahead. Now, our government has made reconciliation with Indigenous peoples a cross-government priority. Budget 2021 includes stable funding to support engagement with Indigenous peoples on a range of matters, including land and resource activities, legislation, and policy. We are also providing more funding to create more childcare spaces for Indigenous families, deliver the skills training uh, initiatives that will lead to long-term employment for unemployed and underemployed Indigenous people, and let's be really clear, racism has no place in this province and in the delivery of its services. So our budget provides funding to implement recommendations from the In Plain Sight report, as well as cultural safety and humility training across health and mental health addiction services. We know that the road um, towards reconciliation and addressing racism is long, and our government will continue to work with Indigenous people and First Nation communities to create a stronger, more inclusive British Columbia. Climate change is one of the most pressing issues facing British Columbians, and we must make sure that a post-COVID future is a greener, more sustainable one. Clean BC is our plan to build a cleaner, more sustainable future. Budget 2021 includes an additional $506 million in new investments to continue to reduce emissions and create new opportunities and promote affordability. Budget 2021's investments bring the total funding for Clean BC to nearly $2.2 billion over five years. By keeping people healthy and investing in communities, we can move forward with a strong economic recovery, a recovery that includes everyone. Budget 2021 includes record levels of capital investment with $26.4 billion in funding over three years. This is a $3.5 billion increase when compared to budget 2020. These investments support a strong and sustainable economy with investments in roads, transit, schools, housing, and hospitals. Investments in hospitals like Cowichan, Surrey, Stewart Lake, Dawson Creek, and the replacement of St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. We're investing in the future of BC through the NBC Investment Fund. This fund will invest $500 million in high growth potential businesses here in British Columbia and leverage investments from the private and public sectors to help businesses grow. The fund will be instrumental in helping people uh, in helping people with promising companies scale up. And it will support startups, anchor talent, and keep jobs and investment right here in our province. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Vernon Monashi MLA, Harwindu, Harwinder Sandu, to share with you the uh, items from the next slide. Harwinder? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Minister, and thanks to the Chamber. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Okanagan Indian Nations. And I'd like to give a shout out to all your Chamber and all the Chambers across BC for uh, doing such an incredible job during the pandemic. I'm also a proud member of Vernon Chamber, and I've seen how quickly Chambers moved and came on board to keep people safe and to have the uh, economy going. So thank you for that. Um, this government recognizes how quickly Kelowna is growing. We're continuing to move forward on major capital investments in healthcare, transit, schools, and affordable housing in Kelowna and in the Okanagan. Uh, just a few highlights from Budget 2021's capital plan includes key investments in education and housing, uh, building on our previous investments at UBC in student housing this year, we are partnering with Okanagan College on a $67.5 million, uh, 376 bed student housing project. Uh, BC Housing is providing approximately 15 million under the Women's Transition Housing Fund program for a 55 units uh, project to promote second stage housing to women and families fleeing violence. In Penticton, families will now have a permanent home for their school community with 11.5 million in funding. Uh, here in Kelowna, we're proud to partner in funding the construction of a new functional imaging facility. It's adjacent to Kelowna General Hospital and purchasing and installing the PET scan and CT scanners. And we have 995 homes underway are complete in Kelowna and more opportunities to come through our new investments in the housing hub. So uh, now I would like to pass it back on to Minister Robinson. Thank you. Thanks, Herwinder. Uh, we, we have been through uh, a great deal, um, not just us here in British Columbia, um, but you know, right, right around the world. And I'm sure every one of us can point to a moment in this last year when our world was turned upside down. And I know that the challenge um, has been you know, particularly acute um, you know, for those of you who have businesses and, and trying to figure out how to navigate through the changing landscape. Uh, COVID-19 has challenged and changed British Columbians in ways that we never could have imagined. But the thing that impresses me the most is just how resilient we are, that we are all resilient, that we look out for each other. Uh, and I will certainly hang on to that for the rest of my life. We also know that a recovery won't happen overnight. But by focusing on the things that matter most to people, we're gonna keep making progress and we are gonna get there. We know that the pandemic will end and that we will be able to move into a recovery. And government will continue to be here for British Columbians. Budget 2021 supports people now to stay healthy and safe. And it looks to the future, a future with opportunities for everyone to be part of a strong, economic recovery. Thank you for being here with us today and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Minister Robinson. That was a terrific overview and some good detail on, on what the government's priorities are. I'm now going to turn things over to uh, other local chambers uh, to ask our first questions of the day. And up next is from the Greater Westside Board of Trade, uh, their chair, Amber Hall. Amber? Thanks, Jeff, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister Robinson, for joining us today and providing an update. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for inviting us to be a part of um, this amazing event. So I do have a question that uh, I'd like to propose. Uh, it's kind of lengthy, but most things are. So <laughs> um, while the bed and breakfast industry understands and appreciates the COVID restrictions, the sector is a, in a particularly difficult position as they do not qualify for many of the supports available. The sector does not generally have staff. B&Bs are usually operated by the couples who own the property and require the income to sustain themselves and their families. And as a result, they cannot claim the Canadian or Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy or the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy. The BC government recovery grants only cover new capital spending and the processing time is very lengthy. 
DNBs still have to pay mortgages, utilities, municipal taxes, and they continue to have to pay fees to service providers like the reservation systems. These costs continue even when they're being asked to not accept reservations, and therefore they have no revenue. There have been suggestions of helping this sector by providing grants that could potentially offset municipal property tax and utilities for the period during which they have to refuse business, and therefore revenue. Uh, what else do you see the province doing to help those in the B&B sector? Okay, that is a lengthy question. Uh, <laughs> um, My apologies. <laughs> no, no, that's 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 fine. That's fine. Um, and I do want to say that we do have a small and medium-sized business grant program that is available, um, and I would encourage um, you know those that, that operate B and Bs to to check it out. Um, but I, we also uh, have the Circuit Breaker Grant program, which very much uh, was designed um, with those sorts of businesses in mind, recognizing that the right thing to do is to not accept travelers uh, at this point. Uh, we have all been asked to stay close to home and I appreciate the sector uh, you know doing the right thing. I know that many have canceled reservations because not everyone was uh, recognizing how important it is that we stay put for the next month or so um, until we can get more vaccinations in arms and so that we can have a robust summer and I know I am dying to you know, get up to the Okanagan and uh, tour the wineries and enjoy the water and the heat. Oh, can't wait for the heat. Um, but we need to do the right thing now so that we can have a summer and so that the, everyone, the businesses that rely on travelers can have that as well. Um, so I do know that we've exp expanded the Circuit Breaker program to include B&Bs um, like uh, the one that you've just described. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Great. Thank you for that, Amber. And now for our next question, uh, I'm going to turn it over to someone from the Penticton Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the chair of their board is Jonathan McGraw, and he is going to join us and ask a question of the minister. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you, Minister Robinson, for joining us today. And uh, Chamber of Commerce in Kelowna, thank you for inviting Penticton. So I, my question, uh, again, this could be a long interlude to the actual question. The question is short, but the interlude is a little bit long. Um, in any given economic cycle, we, we see businesses closing while at the same time new businesses start up. This is especially the case in tourism heavy economies such as the one in Penticton. And that's just a normal part of our business cycle. Uh, we see businesses closing, new ones starting up, and that's, that's natural and normal for us. Unfortunately, we anticipate that some of the businesses in our community will not be operating when the recovery arrives regardless of the program funding that may be available in the 21-22 budget. And it is extremely challenging and risky for any new business to start up while the economy, the economy is currently where it is. So the concern is that there could be a delay with new businesses starting up to fill the gap left by businesses we lost during this period of time. Without new businesses in the queue to start up, we could actually see a long delay in the recovery of our local economy. So my question is, Will a new startup company or business be eligible for any of the 195 million small, medium-sized business recovery grant program funding? And if not, then what kind of help can they find in the upcoming budget? It's a good question. Um, so the small, medium-sized business grant recovery, uh, recovery grant program was designed for existing businesses. Uh, the program has been extended. Uh, and so that means um, th there will be some businesses that started up, for example, after the pandemic hit, and they will be eligible because of the way that they've extended the program. Uh, but there will certainly uh, be bus you know, folks who may choose to not start a business uh, for the last six or eight months because of the pandemic, uh, making a sound business decision. But if I understood your question correctly, you're worried that we won't have the, s the startups that we need uh, going forward and that that will create uh, sort of a gap in service delivery and in business growth. Um, and so what I appreciate hearing from you is, and I appreciate hearing from all uh, chambers is, this is the kind of stuff we need to hear from you. Um, you'll notice in our budget that we've uh, created a significant um, uh, contingencies and recovery uh, that is focused on um, making sure that we have the ability to um, 
uh, create programs where we see a need going forward. None of us have ever been through this before. We have never experienced this kind of a pandemic uh, in modern history. Uh, and so that's why we built in uh, significant contingencies so that we can be responsive to the needs of people and responsive to the needs of business. So what I would ask um, is that you gather the information from what you're hearing and what you're seeing on the ground, and that you continue to engage with us. Uh, minister Callan, um, as uh, the minister responsible for uh, the recovery, uh, is in regularly engaging with chambers of commerce, with boards of trade, with uh, various sectors of the, um, in, in, in the business community to understand what the needs are so that we can help facilitate uh, the growth that uh, we know is going to come. Uh, and I will say, um, we are in really good stead when compared to other provinces. Um, our employment numbers are have surpassed uh, our, our pre-pandemic numbers, which says a lot about the creativity, the resilience of British Columbia. Um, and we are seeing, um, you know, some really other, you know, positive signs in terms of anticipated growth in our GDP going forward. So um, I know that uh, there's, uh, there's lots of opportunity ahead, but I know it won't be easy and we're here to help. So please uh, continue to share this information of what you're seeing and what your concerns are so that we can be there to support, uh, to support everyone going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for that question, and also Minister Robinson for the thoughtful answer. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to the the open Q and A, which we see in the in the Zoom Q question and answer box. And we have three questions in the queue, and I think we'll have time for more than that. So I'm going to encourage everyone to submit more questions. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask comes from Mike Jacobs, who is head of ML Anderson Construction. Uh, you may be familiar, Minister Robinson, a very large employer in our region and throughout the province. And the question is this. Will the government put an annual cap on the employer health tax? We are in construction. We can have employees who work lots of overtime and could earn up to $200,000 per year on a pipeline project or other large infrastructure project. The health tax is $5,000 per year compared to MSP premiums previously being only 1,800. For a crew of 10, the EHT cost is $50,000 versus $18,000. Should there not be an earnings cap like we have for CPP and EI. Uh, so we're not considering a cap, uh, and we were the very last province uh, to uh, phase out MSP premiums and and go to an employer health tax. Uh, so this is uh, uh, exists right right across the the country, uh, and uh, we have one of the lowest um, employer health taxes. So uh, compared to uh, other provinces, uh, we're actually uh, you know the most I would argue the most affordable of of the employer health taxes. Probably not the answer that Mr. Jacobs wanted to hear, but it was- I'm sorry, in, in, I, you know, I need to be honest. All right, so th the next question I'm going to ask is from Keith McIntyre, the owner of Big Bear Software and the Big Bear Innovation Center, which is West Kelowna's first co-working space. There's a bit of top spin on this one, so I'll, 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 I'll read it straight. I would like to ask on behalf of all the business owners that have had to lay off many staff over the last year and have had to adapt and pivot. Has there been any accountability in government to reduce staff and expenses when the government has greatly reduced the services they offer or are, or are government departments exempt from having to demonstrate effectiveness? Us entrepreneurs have had to make tough decisions, have our businesses harmed with unclear and ever-changing rules, but it seems that government is exempt from that. So I'm, I'm going to uh, say uh, to you that uh, our public service has been I'm going to pardon the language, has been busting their asses. They have delivered programs, uh, developed programs in record time. Uh, they have worked, uh, certainly in this pandemic, I want to say I have received notes, briefing notes. I have received uh, feedback. I have received uh, reports midnight sometimes coming through to my email. I have seen staff working weekends, working uh, overtime, not getting overtime, uh, but working hard and diligently on behalf of British Columbians. So what I would tell you is that, that our public service has been delivering in ways that I don't think they would have imagined. Everything from uh, making sure that people can pay rent, a rent supplement program that was developed in 10 days, which is absolutely unheard of, so that people um, could uh, 
at least stay where they're renting when they lost their jobs. So uh, it's government that's had to uh, create programs to support to support that. Making sure that that people um, who lost their jobs had some um, fiscal um, ability to 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 pay for some of their bills. That's been the work of the public service and the public service sector, making sure that we can deliver to millions of British Columbians uh, uh, on our on our programs. Uh, and then what they what people do then with the, with those resources is that they spend it in our communities. You know, when we brought forward um, one of our programs this last December, the supplement, um, I've certainly heard stories of people, you know, getting, you know, $500 um, and, and trying to figure out which businesses in their communities that they were going to support uh, because they had $500 in their pocket uh, and that they were going to spend it in their community and that this has been good for businesses. So, so I am, what I'm going to tell you is that, that the public service has been working very, very hard to take care of British Columbians. And when we talk about the public service, I, 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 I want to remind everyone that, that our teachers are part of the public service, our nurses and doctors and, and tech, uh, technicians in our healthcare service, they're all paid um, uh, as part of the public service. And I can't think of anyone that would suggest that they haven't been working hard uh, doing their part to keep us all safe. Uh, thank you, Minister Robinson, and, and I'm, I'm going to tack on a, a follow-up to, to the question we, we just had there. One of the questions that the Chamber and I think many of us are, are looking at is, how are we going to pay for all this in the future? And, and I don't think it's, it's going to be a surprise that the government is going to look for more revenue somehow. But I wonder, is the government thinking of, of trying to implement a, a rule or guideline that would see us, you know, look at new revenue sources, but for every dollar revenue, say, look at our pre-pandemic arrangement of government and try to find a way to save a dollar. So, efficiency or, or, or whatever else, but just, just as, a, as a guideline or a guide rail for, for bringing in new taxes. Right. So we, we, we developed this budget with very significant guardrails um, in place, making sure that we were you know, only funding those programs that were priority programs. Uh, and I, I can't imagine anyone saying that we should cut back on health care. I mean, I think that that would be uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, British Columbians recognize how important that is to all of us. Um, but uh, we also made sure that we have declining deficits. When you take a look at the three-year plan, you see declining a deficit over the plan. We also know that there's, um, there is still uncertainty in terms of what the recovery is going to look like, how quickly we're going to be able to move through recovery. Um, it's very promising, but we were prudent in what we are saying uh, we're expecting our growth to be over the next uh, year and what the Economic Forecast Council, the economists that are separate from government, and what they're saying. And so we're being very prudent in, uh, in, in being very modest and saying, well, we think growth isn't going to be as quickly as they say it's going to be. So we're again, we're, we're, we're budgeting within a very prudent uh, context. Context. We've also built in a billion dollars in forecast allowance that if, 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 if revenues don't come in the way it's, we're expected, we have some, some room in this budget. Um, and if you take a look across this country, uh, various governments, um, I mean, you take a look at, you know, the conservative governments that are across, across this country, we're well respected uh, with sort of how we have been budgeting and making sure that we are only spending the dollars that are absolutely necessary to spend. Now, having said that, um, I can appreciate the angst that comes with seeing deficit numbers that, that creates angst for all of us in terms of what does that mean going forward. Uh, and um, over, as we see recovery play out, as we see what our growth is, as we see um, what our employment numbers are, and again, our employment numbers are good. We are seeing really good revenue, strong revenues uh, with lumber. Uh, we are seeing um, export opportunities in, in ways that we haven't seen before. Uh, the growth potential here in our province is significant and spectacular. Um, and so we are monitoring all of that and, uh, and, and looking at, so once we have a, a sense of what our direction and recovery looks like and what we can with more certainty predict what growth looks like, we will have a plan uh, for next budget uh, 2022 that demonstrates our commitment as a government to address um, the, the deficits that we see in front of us. But again, I want to reiterate, we are not unique. This is right across the country. Uh, and we have been prudent. We have had balanced budgets uh, as a government, and we're going we're gonna to get back there as well. Thank you, Minister Robinson. Our next question is about agriculture and specifically extension services. And so for those in the audience that don't know, extension services were previously provided by our government where 
uh, experts in, in agrology would assist local farmers and growers uh, to improve yields and, and basically make more of their land and their resources, uh, which of course helps our economy as a whole. And so the question is from Dominic Ramponi, a former board member uh, and also very active in the agricultural community. Um, and he wants to know, are there plans to bring back extension services from the Ministry of Agriculture? Well, what I can tell, tell you is that with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, as we call it now, um, they have a 4% increase in their budget over last year. That's $4.4 million more. Um, and this uh, reflects an additional $10 million over the three-year fiscal plan uh, uh, to expand the Grow BC, Feed BC, Buy BC programs. Um, and I uh, would... Uh, I imagine that uh, this, your member has uh, talked with Lana Popham as the Minister of Agriculture and, and identifying uh, what's the most important thing uh, for, uh, you know, for your member, for the Okanagan around this. And I'm sure she'll, she'll uh, engage with you on, on that. So I'm not going to uh, presume how, to, um, how the minister is going to you know, best identify uh, you know, what, what programs to, to fund. But what I can tell you is that she is the most tenacious most dedicated agricultural minister I have ever seen. She is relentless on this file. And, uh, and I know that uh, she will represent uh, the, this industry uh, really well and the growth of this industry uh, really, really well. And I, what, the other thing I wanna say is um, local food supply. Um, in, early, in the early days of the pandemic, um, I was a minister of municipal affairs and housing. And I spent uh, pretty much every week talking to all the mayors um, and identifying what the issues were, how we can support local leaders. And uh, for the first time in, in my time at, with that ministry, I was hearing about the desire and the demand for local food, that people want their food. Uh, they want the ability to know that we have uh, a good supply of food locally, that's grown locally, that's manufactured locally. Um, and uh, there's, I think, real appetite uh, uh, you know, right around the province to, to see that move forward. And that's why uh, Lana has been, I think, and has always been saying that, um, especially when, and I just a, a quick story, if I might indulge you, when, when we were in, when I was in opposition, um, Lana came in with a, a, a cup of processed peaches um, that uh, were being served at a senior's care home in Peachland. And on the cup, on the writing on the cup, it said, from China. And it made her, I mean, it makes, it all, makes us all crazy that in Peachland, of all places, that the peaches came from China. Um, and so uh, we, I've, 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 that story has never left me because we know what the potential is in the Okanagan and in other parts of the province, in the Kootenays as well. Um, and uh, we need to make better use of our agricultural capacity um, and brilliance. And, uh, and Lana is a tremendous advocate to make sure that we do that. Well, if, if she's as good as you as you say she is, she'll be well received uh, by by our local agricultural community, and and I'm sure we're keen to invite her up here and, and show her um, all the great things that are happening. And you know, we have some you know very advanced food pro uh, fruit processors in the Okanagan, uh, you know, world leading technology, and I'm sure we'd love to show it off to the minister. And, and that's what we've been doing with the food hubs as well. So we've been funding food hubs. And I know that there is one, I think it's called the Zest Food Hub in Salmon Arm, the Shushwap ok Okanagan area. Um, and that offers entrepreneurs an opportunity um, to create and package new products. So we recognize that there's real um, opportunities for small businesses as well to take full advantage of the agricultural goods that, uh, that are grown right around the province. That's excellent. So the next question I have is one that was uh, came in before uh, today's uh, session. The federal government recently announced that it will be imposing a national speculation tax aimed at foreign property owners. Will the BC government re-examine its own speculation and vacancy tax and consider exempting Canadians who have second homes where the BC tax applies? Um, so we're not considering uh, changing our tax framework. And um, I, the first that we heard was uh, the day before our budget about the federal government's plan. Uh, and so we're, we're currently taking a look at what their plan is. We haven't been able to get the details just yet. Uh, and we'll see sort of how they how the two uh, work uh, in tandem. And so uh, as I take it, there will be some consideration of seeing how the federal tax works. And, and we're, we're just concerned in the Okanagan. We are one of the few jurisdictions subject to this. Uh, we're, we're concerned about a double taxation that, that would be overly mm -hmm. punitive for our mm -hmm. region. 
Yeah, well, we do, and like I said, we haven't seen yet um, how the federal government is planning to implement this, what this looks like. So we'll be certain to um, engage with the federal government to identify how, how you know, what their plan is. It's not as, um, and not as fully delineated as I would have hoped. Let me just say that at this point. There's more, more, more to come and more to learn about what they're planning to do. That's a careful answer. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so my next question, this touches on one of one of the themes of, of reconciliation and also uh, about the Urban Mayor's Task Force and, and greater um, direct support to local governments, particularly those in large uh, urban centres that, that have you know, great demands due to uh, the homelessness crisis, mental health crises, transportation, all these things seem to be falling on local governments. And, and we've seen that um, BC's casinos lately haven't been providing the revenue stream they historically have to our government. And, and our government's managed to find ways to, to at least rein in the deficits without help from the casinos. Would this government consider turning over proceeds from gaming directly to local governments and Indigenous communities? So um, we, uh, we, we do have a, um, a revenue sharing agreement with Indigenous communities that we brought in, I believe it was last year, uh, 7%, and so that's a significant. Uh, but it's interesting, just in light of your previous question around being in deficit and getting out of deficit, and then, you know, again, uh, shifting around, uh, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is the challenge, right? We are all uh, working hard to deliver services for the people that we, that we represent, and we represent them uh, in different orders of government. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, and I know that local governments um, have been um, working collaboratively with provincial government. Now we have a federal government finally that's also doing some housing. And I want to give a shout out to the Kelowna Mayor, uh, Mayor Bastron, who's been an incredible advocate, uh, certainly with the, the, the large city uh, mayor's caucus um, or the urban mayor's caucus, um, but also just, in, you know, advocating for more resources in Kelowna for, for homelessness. And we have been doing that and delivering that. And there's absolutely more to do um, going forward. And we're continuing to be committed to, to do that so that you know, local governments uh, don't have to do it alone. Uh, but again, the challenge is always, um, how do we do this? So on the one hand, people, you know, we, we want to get out of debt. We, 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 we recognize that. This is a revenue stream uh, that uh, helps us deliver the services that everyone counts on and continues to, um, to, to deliver for British Columbians. So, uh, so no, the, the, I guess the short answer is no, we're not considering doing that. Um, but I recognize that uh, we've all been challenged in ways. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is about taking care of British Columbians and we all have a role to play. And uh, this provincial government is not backing down from our responsibility to taking care of people who don't have homes. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, I'll segue from, uh, from from that discussion of homes to my next question. And so Okanagan businesses need newcomers to grow, uh, but the high cost of housing is proving to be a deterrent to attracting talent. And we know that BC Housing does some work in terms of supportive housing, and there are, there's, there's a, 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 what I characterize as a relatively small home ownership program, uh, but it seems to us that the, the rising cost of market-based housing is the major concern. And the chamber always hears calls for government to do more about that. And, and the suggestions we've heard include giving greater grants or tax incentives to first time home buyers or those relocating to our province from elsewhere, uh, rationalizing what government costs are built into housing at every level of government uh, with the goal of, of uh, perhaps making sure that housing hasn't been treated as a cash generator for government. And then uh, finally allocating land under government control uh, to a land bank. Uh, to create new affordable residential development. What do you think of these suggestions and what else can be done uh, to make more affordable housing for workers in the Okanagan? So again, I, 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 this is such a great question. And again, I, I just want to contrast that with your previous question around the speculation tax, which is there are people who have two and three homes uh, and uh, there are people who can't even get one home. And so this is always the, the tension. And so if you're going to have two or three homes, you're going to pay a spec tax if, you want to, if you're not going to rent them out, you know, but at least rent them out. So again, this is the tension. Uh, and uh, this question sort of highlights sort of the other side of that equation. Um, 
But I want to talk, take, take a moment to talk about middle income housing because I, I agree completely. It's, it's a piece, uh, it's called the missing middle. It, it's a piece of, of, of the, the puzzle that, that um, hasn't historically been addressed well. Uh, and so there's a number of pieces that we're doing and, and I'll speak first to the piece that we're doing in this budget and that's with the housing hub. The housing hub was designed a couple of years ago uh, and tasked with finding ways to partner with various um, organizations in the private sector, in the public sector, in the nonprofit sector to deliver housing uh, that is more affordable for middle income folks, whether it's rental housing and perhaps it's uh, trying to find ways to do affordable home ownership. Um, and so they have delivered to date about a thousand homes, uh, and this is middle income homes, people making $75,000, $80,000 a year. Uh, and we uh, recognize what the opportunities are and um, what has been incredibly helpful is understanding that if we can provide uh, the, uh, the private sector and uh, not-for-profit sector um, housing builders, housing developers with construction financing at government rates, that it helps reduce the overall cost of that housing. And so that's why in this budget, we've announced $2 billion in construction financing that will help drive the costs down. But uh, I think there's more that can be done. And this is where local governments come in. Uh, and there's work happening uh, through Josie Osborne, uh, the Minister for Municipal Affairs. Uh, and again, this is where all orders of government need to be working together. Uh, local governments need to work faster on their permitting process. And so we are working together with uh, local governments uh, and incenting them in, in numerous ways to identify ways to move the permitting process faster because Money and time are connected, and if we could get uh, housing uh, permitted uh, faster, um, then uh, it's it's cheaper money, and uh, and that's part of what uh, we're we're looking to do. And the third thing I want to say that I also think um, is not what I would call a, a sexy piece of the pie, but it's an important piece of the pie, is you brought in legislation requiring all local governments to, uh, and I believe they have to have it in place by this year, um, is to have a housing needs assessment done. I was a city councillor and we were saying yes to a whole bunch of developments of 600 square foot condos for years and years and years um, that frankly were sitting empty, uh, that were uh, for speculators uh, and the people were parking their money and they became, um, um, you know, safety deposit boxes in the sky in my community of Coquitlam. And uh, that was not helpful, but we didn't know different because the development community kept saying, well, there's demand. Well, it was speculative demand. It wasn't demand for, for families. It wasn't speculative. It wasn't demand for downsizing. It really was investor demand. Um, and so now local governments are required to, by law, to develop a housing needs assessment, to update it every five years, and to make it public. And in this housing needs assessment, they're required to take a look at what the housing needs are of the community and what they're anticipated to be. So it's not about building for speculation. It's not about identifying what the speculative opportunities are. It's building the housing that people need. People need to, you know, to, to grow their businesses so that you can have people that you can hire. They need to live somewhere. Um, and so it's through this piece of legislation that we're going to have a better idea um, and we get to hold local governments accountable for making the right decisions on the land use planning side. So the, the, the housing that they're saying yes to is housing that we need for families, not housing that we need for speculation. Well, thank you, Minister Robinson. Uh, that's, that's a very thorough answer and, and you know, Clearly, your experience in local government has has helped you understand these housing issues at, at great depth, and, and that's that's something that gives us confidence. Um, we're now at the end of our time, actually right at the end, so it'll be a very brief thank you. But I do want to say thank you. Uh, it is very important for members to hear from from a horse's mouth, as as they say, directly from the minister. I want to thank the uh, Okanagan School of Business for sponsoring our speaker series in today's event. I want to, want to let everyone know that today's recording will be made available on our resources page at colonachamber.org. And I'll finally mention that as a small token of our appreciation, we'll be making a small donation to uh, our local charity, the Central Okanagan Community Food Bank uh, in the minister's honour. Um, that doesn't break any lobbying rules, so, so we're good doing it that way. So thank you again, Minister Robinson. Thank you again, Okanagan School of Business. And thank you all to our audience, and especially those who put their hands up and ask questions. I look forward to seeing you again, and please enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.